the interviewed Phil Thomas Cat here, and this next segment, many would consider cool. <laughs> So tell me, who are you and what do you do? Well, my name is Phil Thomas Cat. I'm a music video producer, a filmmaker, and a singer-songwriter. And I've been doing it for, well, a number of years. Absolutely. You most certainly have, is from what I understand in my research on you. Phil, tell me, what made you start music? Uh, what, 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 well, actually, was it music that you started or did you want to originally interview people? What, what got you into the business that you do? Well, I, I recall when I was very young, I say young, I was 10, I was playing, <laughs> playing radio station. You know, I'd play records and I'd pretend to be the DJ. And uh, in the, uh, I guess it would have been the, the early 70s, I got a schematic and I built a transmitter, an AM transmitter, and I started a local or say local, real local, neighborhood radio station. D didn't broadcast too far out. Right. Well, it yeah. was far enough the FCC came. <laughs> <laughs> I had a very tall pine tree for my antenna. <laughs> and uh, my dad got fined uh, some money, I think several hundred dollars, for, for my violation. And, of course, that ended my radio station days then. Later on, I, I really wanted to do um, music because... I was really digging music, and I, I got into an artist named Bread, David Gates and Bread. Baby, I'ma want you. Yeah, yeah. And I, uh, I just loved the music. In fact, Baby, I'ma want you. The song itself is the song I believe that led me to songwriting because there was a neighborhood girl that lived um, over the fence, and uh, her name was Trina, and I used to sing. Trina, I'm a won't you? I saw, says, I've seen your music video. That, yeah, actually. That's all it takes. That's all it takes is just writing words, you know. So, you know, at least from that, from the lyric standpoint. Yeah. And then I just wanted to do it. So I learned to play guitar and I started gigging and, you know, everything. Absolutely. Did you start, um, did you like, did you get like a local band to go? Did you just, were you just playing gigs originally? Because I noticed in your earlier videos, I noticed like you always have different musicians that just hung out with you and, uh, Filmed, I actually saw uh, what was it? You had uh, you re rented a tape recorder from somewhere, and you and your friend, and you uh, did some type of songs you just recorded on tape uh, right after. He was actually the one who was, I believe, he featured on Nine Lives with you or something. I cannot remember the gentleman's name. If you're talking of Ty Bracken, that's who it yes, is. Yes, Ty Bracken sadly passed away recently. Did he? Yeah, very sad because he was. Uh, I mean, I worked with him for years. Yeah, we did a number of songs and collaborations, and uh, I learned a lot from Ty too. I mean, uh, the most important thing I learned was always have a backup. <laughs> <laughs> it's very good. It's very good. So basically, when you started in the music scene, you actually started as a band, like you were playing at small venues, stuff like that. I was. So? I was doing a duo. Okay. And I was a teenager at the time, so I wasn't okay. really playing venues, but we were playing parties. Okay, like house parties. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so. fire, you know, out by fire, uh, campfire, that type of stuff. And um, that was a lot of fun. His name was Roger Beasley, and we played together for for several years. And we recorded some stuff on uh, an eight-track recorder I had. Now, I'm not talking about one of them fancy, smancy, <laughs> multi-track ones. I'm talking about the kind you stick in with a cartridge and it goes thump thump on the second track and unfortunately one of my favorite songs had the thump thump right in the middle of it during that recording but we had a lot of fun doing that in those days and uh, it was just a simple home eight track recorder very awesome very awesome well um to, let's progress a few years later you you, you were just uh, talking about a little while ago you did actually get signed at some point from with your music who, who did you get signed by I was signed with King Records. Okay. And uh, I had a producer 
from Nashville, so I had to fly to Nashville to record the song. It was Rockin' in My Chevy and What Went Wrong. Those were the two songs I cut in Nashville. And uh, the record was released um, nationally, and uh, it, it, you know, it didn't do quite well enough yeah. to, uh, to go, you know, go the big route. Man. Yes. And I blame it all on disco. I really did. It just ruined the rockabilly vibe. Exactly. I was I was rockabilly in the hell out of that thing, and yeah. disco just came and uh, you know did its thing. <laughs> well, it had its time, most certainly. Well, let, let's go by a few years later. Um, when you were playing there, even when you were signed, did you just decide one day wake up? Uh, did you say, "Hey, I'm gonna start interviewing people"? Is it you decided that you wanted to be part of saying, "Like, I just want to interview local musicians." How did how did that come to be? Well, when I was doing Catline. I uh, started promoting my album, Nine Lives, and it was really just doing real well locally. And uh, unbelievably well. I couldn't believe it at the time. And uh, so I decided, wow, I'm doing so well just promoting this on Catline, my answer machine. I want to see if I can help some other local artists. Yeah. And so I created the name un the Uncharted Zone for Uncharted Artist. Yeah. Okay, that's where the name comes from. Exactly. That's very cool. I did not know. So kind of like just the un underground artists that are yes. right now. Yeah, it's very cool. And so I, I began promoting them on Catline. And then later I moved over into radio again. I had worked in radio previously, but yes. I got out for a while. But then I got back into radio, started doing the Uncharted Zone on my radio show, up until the corporations didn't like local music anymore and so then I decided to just go out on my own yes and I've been that way ever since okay very very cool yeah I, I've seen quite a lot of interviews just I mean it, it, I keep finding endless and endless videos of interviews and musicians that you've produced on your own channel or even uh, basically gave a chance to be like hey these people are out here in the world check them out and that's very cool I, I think that the interviews really started a little bit on Catline a little more on radio, but then I really got into it deep by the time we were doing the television show. Most certainly. And, and oh, no, excuse me. And it Go. wasn't that I really, you know, that that was my, my dream to interview people. It was just a necessity for the show. Yes. And, and I wanted to promote the local artist, and I thought that was a, a part of the way to do it. It was like an element to your exactly, show, pretty much. Exactly. Very awesome. Very awesome. Uh, Phil, well, once you start interviewing, how did you even get on television? Like, you were broadcasted locally. Was it in the 80s, the 90s? When were you broadcast locally, and how did you come by to actually get on television? Well, it was in the 90s, and I bought airtime. Okay. And then sold commercials to pay for the airtime and hopefully uh, make a little profit. Yeah. Was airtime expensive to broadcast? I think so. It was, it was, it was relatively pricey? expensive at the time Most for certainly. me anyway. Yeah, absolutely. And did you broadcast, like, I, I understand back then you could have cheaper slots at cheaper times of if when less people are up or stuff like that. Did you broadcast at a time that most people weren't awake type of thing? or? Well, what we did, we had a uh, 5.30 show in the afternoon on Fridays. Friday afternoon. It started out as a half hour show. And then I wanted to do a local countdown, a local top 10, so that local artists could get excited about being number one and things like that. And so I did a spinoff show that came on Saturday nights at midnight. And it became our most popular show. Everybody was talking about the countdown and it was an hour show. So it was doing so well, I needed more space on the uh, afternoon show as well so we expanded it too and at one time we even had a friday night rerun show that was just a rerun from the past really a late night midnight one okay very cool very cool so let's uh let's jump forward uh you know you get past the 90s a little bit it's the uh mid 2000s early 2000s you yourself are at this time the uncharted zone is gaining a little bit more popularity um, you come by artists such as Mark Gormley and stuff that really shot off on YouTube at an early time of YouTube. Tell me, how did you meet like uh, Mark Gormley? Uh, that's I know that that's probably people's known as one of your biggest things that you've done that you produced. Well, Mark was like any other artist. He just contacted me, wanted me to make him a music video. Okay. So we set up a schedule. He came. We shot it. I put it together, and um, you know we we up. I don't remember if we uploaded them right at first because I really wasn't into YouTube right at first. I was just doing the broadcast thing. Um, 
and I started kind of evolving in the, into just YouTube, and that's what I ultimately wanted to do anyway. But it, I guess we just started emerging and getting more popular during the, uh, I would probably say, somewhere from 07 to 09. Yeah, absolutely. Um, can I ask what the feeling was when you, did you just wake up one day and then your video on YouTube is just millions of views up and it's nationally, this everyone is watching your production of Mark Gormley, did, did, did you just, did not expect it or like, what, what was your first thought when you, like, how did it go? Well, I, I truly didn't expect it, I've got to say that, and I likely at first didn't even notice it because I wasn't monitoring the channel very closely at yeah, the time. because you didn't think too much of it. No, it was it was not my main priority. The, <laughs> yeah. the broadcast show was. Yeah. And so, uh, but of course that changed. And uh, it did, there was a different feeling about it. But some of the things that, that I felt were was interesting was like having a band contact me from Austin, Texas. Hey, we want to do a music video. <laughs> and I thought, really? You know, I kind of thought it just somebody, you know. Yeah, messing with you or something. Yes, yeah. exactly. And so we set up a time. I kind of wasn't expecting them to show. Yeah. They did show, and the video turned out great, too. And, and since then, we've had bands from all over the country come. I mean, from Detroit and just everywhere. Yeah. You know, Phil, I would honestly consider you one of those, like, you had some, well, I don't know if you consider it clout at one time, at one time, especially at the Mark Gordley era, like, you had this clout and everyone, I believe, was just like, knew you internationally. And I think as a artist, I that's got to be an awesome feeling, pretty much, just to shoot out of nowhere. I mean, and Mark Gormley, like, uh, I mean, you were talking about earlier, he uh, he got he got invited by Jimmy Kimmel, I believe, and uh, Weird Al Yankovic is actually wants to, like, Pensacola, like, I believe, anime cons or something like that, dressed as Mark Gormley, and that's someone you produce. I mean, that's just got to be the coolest feeling in the world, you know? <laughs> yeah, it is. I mean, I'll, I'll admit that. It's a lot of fun, you know, and uh, honestly, the the thing that I enjoy most over actually making music videos and being an artist myself is, is the fame of it because that's to me that that's my main goal. It's never been money. I mean, yeah. you know, as long as I can make a living, I'm cool yeah. with that. You want to be known for yeah. what you do. Yeah, I would take that over the money any day because yeah. it's uh, I don't know. I guess I just enjoy it, I, and I, I know that's kind of an ego kind of thing. No, to it's, a point. It's well, not, well, no. I, I think it is, but I think I've I've grown up. Yeah. To a point, my my ego is not. You know, maybe when I was younger, I probably <laughs> would have been a little more. Uh, you know, egoy. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I, I feel like that's the whole point as um, musicians or any type of art form you're doing. You know, it's, I don't think it's an egotistical thing because I think you do this art and you want people to know what your art is. Exactly. It's your art, your expression of how you do things, and here's the people I do it with. And I completely agree with you that like the money is whatever, but you going the rest of your life knowing that people would know you for this awesome thing you did. I don't think it's ego at all. I think it's very cool. But, yeah. Mostly. You know what? What I enjoy, you know, along with doing UZ, is is the radio show that I'm doing every Friday night. Yeah, I've listened to it. I've yes. had calls from New Zealand, Australia, you know, all over the all over the country, all over the world. Yeah. And to me, that's fascinating, and that's more fun. Then when I was working in uh, commercial radio years and years ago, uh, you know, I was lucky to get out of town with, yeah. the, with these <laughs> with these stations. <laughs> but now I go around the world, and so to me, I find that much more fun. Very cool. Um, can I ask you um, over the years who who is your favorite? Well, of course, you know I'm from Atlanta based, so I don't know too many people around here. But who is your favorite Pensacola artist? Nate, like a couple people that you've really like just local artists that even maybe you've produced like who are some of your favorites phil from locally local pensacola yes well of course there's mark i mean you know i, I like mark's music i liked it from day one when i uh, first heard his cassette that he brought over to me to to use for the uh, audio of the videos so he's up there and he helped change a lot of things for UZ, so I appreciate him like that as well. Yeah. Also like a guy named Rusty McHugh. Sadly, he's passed away, but he was funny. Was he? <laughs> he, he wrote some songs and did performances out at the uh, Floribama Lounge, which is a, a lounge that was really famous several years ago here for the Songwriter Festival and several other things. And Rusty McHugh, he was an incredible artist. Very cool. Ken Manning's also one. Um, I was actually going to say um, Ken Manning is 
truly my favorite artist from the Uncharted Zone. Um, I know other people have more fame, but Ken to me is a unique artist. I feel like it's a shame that he's not more well known because he is genuinely a good songwriter. And the UFO Gulf Breeze, they, the he won the Crystal what what it was the Crystal award Real Award. And the way he explained that to me, that's like that's kind of like the local. Uh, Film award. It was actually a state state award oh, it's for a state, state of award. Florida. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very. It's very. I thought that was awesome. I thought he was like just even before he met you. He is such an intuitive. Like uh, he's a very creative artist. Very yeah, cool guy. Is. And the thing about Ken, he didn't come around. I mean, the artists nowadays they don't do anything but say, "Give me the PTK edit." <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> but back then Ken would bring storyboards. And, you know, we would shoot the exact angles and all sorts of stuff. It, it was amazing. And most of his early videos were were edited entire anal entirely analog. Yeah. yeah. You know, the old razor blade way. And yeah. so, I think he told me he did it tape, like he edited it with tapes and stuff on his own. Or well, I actually, I that. edited uh, Guffrey's UFO. Did you really? Yes, I did. That's very awesome. It was, um, can, you know, it was primitive, of course, because yeah. it was all analog. And, yeah. uh, and plus the quality of our cameras was was nowhere near the quality of what <laughs> people have on their smartphones now. But <laughs> yeah. still, you know, at least we had a camera. Yeah, absolutely. That, that's very cool. Phil, can I ask a the local artist, uh, you know, it, well, even if locally or anybody who's going to watch this, do you have advice for up-and-coming musicians? That, like, what is really good advice that if someone would have came to you 30 years ago and said, hey, Phil, you should do this in this way. Do you have advice for upcoming musicians who need encouragement or advice or anything for how to get their start? I think the most important thing is perseverance. Sticking with your with your project, setting your goals, and not worrying about the, the mountain. Just do the pebbles to work your way up to the mountain. Because if you're always continuously worrying about making it instead of creating the art, I think it can possibly sometimes damage the art. And so uh, I just say stick with it. Don't give up. And don't let anybody tell you you can't do it. I had a hundred people, no, more than that, probably thousands, <laughs> tell me I can't do it. <laughs> but uh, I, I just did it anyway. And so I think anybody that really wants something, they can get it and go for it. And you are a shining example of that, Phil Thomas. You no, think thank you. I, no, and also you, you think you started in what uh, the '80s, and you come, and then you know one day you have something you didn't even expect. It. I think it's in life it's what you least expect is what happens. Then one day your produced video of Mark Gormley, four million views, two million views. I mean, uh, it's amazing. You are an example of like why artists should not give up. Most certainly, in my personal opinion. Yeah. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Most certainly. Um, you have anything to say before we close this interview? Well, I, let me say I appreciate you coming down to do this. No, thank you. It was great to meet you, and I appreciate the kind words you've said about uh, me and about you, Z. And oh, the famous Phil Thomas cat. How could I miss an opportunity like this? <laughs> <laughs> so just thanks for coming down. I appreciate it. Okay, awesome. This has been our interview with Phil Thomas Cat, and we're signing out.